Hey, you guys. Welcome to the Strategic Success Podcast. I'm excited, Chris. I know we've known each other for a few years now, especially both being in the Louisiana market. And so I'm looking forward to, you know, introducing folks to you, but also just jumping into this conversation. So how about you introduce yourself to folks? Tell us like what you do, where you're based out of, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. I've been, you know, we've been, I think you came to one of my first masterminds three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. That's where I first met you. Um, based out of Lafayette, Louisiana, 43 years old, um, five kids, been married for 22 years, same one for 26 years, been an entrepreneur for 20 years, started my first business at 22 out of the back of my truck, changing oil, washing cars when I was in college. Yeah. Always had a knack for, or a drive and motivation to want to make money. Yeah. Right. And, um, I was hard headed and I couldn't hold down a job. I'm, I'm unemployable. Cause that, yeah. I'm so uh, hard headed. <laughs> I want to do what I want to do, right? Which a lot of entrepreneurs, I think, have that same. You probably like that. Yeah. You know, we 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 want a better life than what society kind of offers sure. as a nine to five or a W two job. And I knew I couldn't get that with just a regular job. And pursued the entrepreneur career while I was in college and started a business out of the back of my truck. Took that on-site all change business and uh, ended up diversifying. By the time I was uh, a senior in college, I was doing auto glass, winter repair, tire rotations. I was washing and waxing and I was changing oil. And I picked up a ton of fleet accounts around the Lafayette area with all the all field accounts. I made $127,000 my senior year while I was doing that, while I was doing school. So yeah. when I graduated, I was like, well, I'm not going to get a job. Sure. I'm going to keep doing that. And that's not really even what I wanted to do. I just, I just wanted to start a business, so I just that's what I ended up doing. Yeah, did that for about a, eight months after I graduated college, and I realized it wasn't scalable. Chasing around, you know, people on site, time restriction. I got another truck and trailer, so I scaled it to two trucks and trailers. But I was like, man, this is not scalable. Making good money. I told myself I need a physical location. I need to buy some real estate. So I started putting feelers out at Quick Lubes and end up finding somebody that was a motivated. Uh, landlord of a tenant they were renting the quick loop mechanic shop to that wouldn't pay in rent on time yep and i got wind of it so i went and talked to her her name was matter of fact madeline bustani and um sweet old lady and i ended up talking to her and said hey i heard he's not paying on time and she kicked him out and put me in so sees an opportunity from a motivated uh landlord landlord yeah. that that tenant wouldn't pay in rent on a commercial property that was my yeah. first shop then doubled my income right away. Yeah, because people were coming to you. Yes, you go to them. Yes, we're doing, and I'm still offering on-site all change. Then I was like, okay, I did that for about a year. I was like, I want to, I want another shop. Yeah. Put some more feelers out. Figured out another guy wasn't uh, paying his taxes, and he was on all kind of drugs on a really desirable location here on Johnson Street in Lafayette, and um, caught wind that he wasn't that he was about to go under. So I went talk to him and said, hey man, why don't you sell it to me? I already know you're about to go under. Yeah, and uh, ended up finding somebody else's out actually outbidded me on the on the deal, and I, I offered a hundred thousand dollars more. Once I found out he just because I wanted it so bad, he yeah. owner financed that extra hundred thousand because he didn't even appraise. I paid over retail for it. Yeah, because I wanted it was such a good location. I knew I could make it. I was real good at sales. I was do, I was crushing with the other shop. Got my second shop. Um, now you probably asked, I bought that second shop. So the first one you were a tenant, the second one, I bought, you it. bought it. Now, Eight. was it all with owner financing or no. like part? Of Only a hundred thousand. The purchase price was $860,000. Mm -hmm. So I had to, I got an SBA loan. I had to put, say, yeah. I had to put a, I had to put $127,000 down. I didn't have it. Yeah. By the grace of timing, the sun, moon, and stars lined up. This is three months before the 2008 crash. I put my personal house for sale. I sold it three months before the 2008 crash. I made $126,000, $1,000 less than what I needed for the down payment. Yeah. I, I can scrounge up a thousand. Yeah, yeah, I got a thousand. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know that that just worked out beautifully. I put it for sale. It sold 30 days later. Then two months later, the market crash is probably worth 60,000 less than what I sold it to that guy for. Yeah. But I got my shop, bought a foreclosure, lived in that, rehabbed that, lived in that, I think uh, 16, 18 months, flipped that, made 70,000, used that for another down payment for a shop. And I did that four times. And I flipped another piece of property, made 40 grand. I kept flipping real estate to buy mm -hmm. quick lube mechanic shops. So that was the, the kind of the, the first five years of my entrepreneur career. 
Sure. So, so you're sitting there, so you're obviously seeing the impact of business, but business done in the right scalable way, yeah. right? Because if you would have only ever stayed going to people's, you know, going to them, yeah. you wouldn't have reached that. And then, all right, so then you get, you know, the brick and mortars, right? You're yep. getting the shops. And then you're starting to see the power of one of a motivated person, right? Yep. And then you're starting to see the power of what real estate can do, mostly the shops or your your primary residence, right? Yep. The name of the game's motivated selling. That's not just in real estate. I was doing this game back before anybody talked about it. I just naturally like go sure. find the motor. I, motivated seller means opportunity. Look, absolutely. And at the end of the day, I mean, there's always going to be some type of opportunity in a marketplace, any different industry. You just have to figure out what that looks like. Yeah. We call it motivated seller and we know it's, you know, people who are behind their taxes, about to go bankrupt, foreclosure, you know, all those things. But any industry someone's in, you could go find, you can find that opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's across the board. Uh, and just to preface that, you know, so I, I did that for the first, I was the first five years. I scaled up to four locations, had 33 employees. We're doing probably about $3 million in revenue between the four shops, two and a half, three million bucks. And scaled that for a little while, got so focused on that, started making a lot of money. I was 26 years old, making half a million bucks a year. It was good money for me back then. I was like, well, I kind of forgot about real estate, right? Sure. Although I was a real estate investor because I, I owned all the shops I was in. The, the first shop that I ended up leasing, two years later, she ended up selling it to me. And I bought it. So I owned yeah. all four of my locations, which is key for you guys listening, you know, is if you can own the real estate and the business on top of it. Well, and that's where, I mean, McDonald's and all them, yeah. so many of them are so powerful because they've included the real estate right. in that. That's exactly yeah. right. They've, set, they've, uh, they've, they've realized the power of those prime locations, though, too. Yeah, and, and that's what I did, and I did that for uh, probably till 2011. Uh, 2010, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I was like, man, this yeah, makes like, a lot of sense. As you start thinking about real estate. Yeah, yeah. yeah, too, yeah. But, but this is... You'd already been doing things, and then yeah. you finally decided to pick a book. It's funny, most people pick up the book first. And Correct. Like, yeah. Somebody gave me the book. One of my sister's boyfriends gave me the book, and I was like, man, this makes complete sense. I already do this naturally. Yeah. But it re... It re ingrained, like, I need, to, I need to get into real estate more. So yeah. went and I was like, I want to get more real estate. So I went, ended up going buy a bunch of single family homes off of MLS with a realtor. Yeah. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know, kind of, I made tons of offers with a realtor and I got okay deals, right? Yeah. I, I was, you know, trying to, to get, do direct to sell a more, Well, I didn't even understand what direct to sell marketing was back then. Bought 33 single family homes, probably overpaid for them, bought them at like 80 cents on the dollar. Yeah. And it, it's really not a good deal at 80 cents on the dollar. Right. People think that's a good deal. It's not. <laughs> because the market pulled back. Sure. I ended up buying 33 single family homes from 2012 to 2014. The market in 2014 crashed in Lafayette because oil went from $128 a barrel to $28 a barrel. And all these houses that I had went damn near. Because all your tenants were yeah. in oil and gas they here all, in Louisiana, it's a very prominent, but especially in, in, in this area. Over here. Yeah. yeah, they all lost their job. Half my tenants went vacant right away. So that was a big, big down moment for me. I was like, oh man. Um, and, I, and, I, and I bought a nice house. I bought like $150,000, $200,000 house that I can get $1,500 to $2,000 a month. That was, that was a mistake. It was too, too high end. In addition to that, all of my oil field accounts that I had in the oil field, yep, with your quick lube. quick lubes, they started going down. So I was I was I was losing twenty thousand dollars a month and went yeah. And then I didn't tell my wife we had like a third or fourth kid, and she, there's no way I could tell her this. But we were, we were sinking. We were gonna go bankrupt. This, I was like, I'm yeah. I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I was like, man, real estate got me to where I'm at. Let me go back and I'm doing something wrong. So I, yeah. I started, go, I went on YouTube and I started typing in real estate investing and just watching tons of videos. And this one black guy, uh, Nassaro, I think his name. Yeah. He's he, up uh, the, I, the, 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 the Duru. I'm not a guru. I'm a Duru. Yes. I'll never forget that. And he's like, he's riding around neighborhood showing checks. I just made 30 grand. Yeah. I don't even own, I never bought this house. I just flipped the paper. I was like, wholesale real estate. How the hell are you wholesale real estate? So ended up watching all his videos, like, man, there's something in this. I actually understood the process by watching enough YouTube University and I wholesaled some of our properties and made like a thousand. As a matter of fact, the first deal I made, I made 2,500. It was on a, my purse, the house that I had bought. I made 2,500 wholesaling it. 
I was like, okay, this is a real thing. So I hired a mentor. Actually, I hired three mentors back to back to back. The first mentor stole $50,000 from me. I had him arrested. He went to jail. He got on drugs. You'd found him. Let's let's deep dive that. You would found him online on yeah, YouTube? YouTube, yep. So I think a lot of people are seeing that right now in this market. Um, I literally just got back. You know, I was in out of town and and again, another person told me another story of someone that is going under. And, you know, back in the day when I was doing a ton of wholesaling myself and I was spending 30 grand a, a year to be in masterminds, a lot of those folks aren't in the game right now. And so this guy was someone that you found online who was doing a lot of marketing and branding. What do you think is something that people should, like, how do they vet the people they learn from? Dude, this is such an extremely important question because I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt from empirical evidence, there are very few people online yeah. that are good at branding and are actually good entrepreneurs. Yeah, right. They, they don't do both well. Exactly. And then people, a lot of times people will see someone and they'll say, well, they don't have a social media account. They can't be real. Yep. They can't be good. Those are the best entrepreneurs. Well, that's part of my heart with my my podcast is to have conversations. 90 plus percent of my conversations are with people who don't have social media yep. accounts, don't have a YouTube account. Like, and it's like, I want to show you that like, hey, people can be brilliant and like fantastic investors, entrepreneurs, but not have some huge yep. following. And people disregard that all the time. Oh, well, I can't go look them up and they have, you know, a million that's right. <laughs> followers. Yep. And so, um, but we're seeing that right now. We are. I mean, we're seeing Ponzi schemes being discovered. It feels like weekly and monthly at this point. Yep. It's, it's because they, you know, they made a full-time living coaching and in the market, the coaching space pulled back because real estate's down and they didn't have a real business. Yeah. And they just, they're hurting. So, I mean, it, you have to understand that, you know, you, there's a lot of good information with, with coaches out there, Yeah. but man, it, you got to really dig deep and make sure that they're not just yeah. fly by night entrepreneurs. One of the biggest things that I, at least when it comes to this, I've always just said, be careful with what metric you you're attracted to. Yeah. If the metric you're attracted to is I've got thousands of properties and I have this Lamborghini. Yeah. Careful. Because if someone, I was just talking about this with someone, I said, look, if someone said I have 500 doors and they're all they're doing is showing me their Rolex and this and that, um, okay, are you impressed? But the question is, what if every single one of those doors were losing three hundred dollars a month, or yep. half of them were, were 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 vacant? You know, and there's a reality there. It's again, careful what metric you qualify someone with, yep. and people just don't know how to. It boils down people don't know how to do due diligence. It's the idea that all Americans don't read. You know, they don't they don't read what they sign. They don't ask a second question. They kind of take things at face yep. value. They don't do critical thinking. No. And they believe everything everybody says. Yeah. And it's it's a shame because a lot of people on social media are just absolutely full of shit. Absolutely. And I know most of them. Yeah. I speak on stages with most of them. And I know for the past six, seven years I spoke with them. I told my wife, I said, a lot of these guys that I've met stage I spoke with, they all full of shit. I can just tell. Yeah. yeah. I know. Like, I'm an entrepreneur. I know, like, I, it's too flashy. Yeah. It's too scripted. It's too rah, rah, look at me. And don't get me wrong. I'm on social media, too. Right. And I have a brand too, so I'm not saying in all cases, but you know, it's bad. It is. And and so that's something I think people have to recognize is like, if you don't want to be vulnerable to getting, you know, God, yeah. like, but, but we're all susceptible to we it, are. right? And it's, but it's one of those things is, is like saying, Hey, my first mentor, I'm, I'm not, I'm saying this because I, I got had, I mean, 50 grand. I, yeah. I mean, it was a lot of money and I got, I got back half of it, but the other half I couldn't get back. But yeah, it's. It's really bad. But there's a ton of power into it. Um, you know, I I am not where I am today if it wasn't for yes. my mentors and how I've continued to educate myself. So yep. it's huge. Um, all right. So you hired your first mentor. You had that. But look, you stayed in. Some people would take that and that, that blow to the gut would, would take them out. Yeah. But somehow during that time, and especially, was that still the time when the market was really tough and you were you were struggling? For which which section? Because you were saying, um, all right, so all your rentals, you were, you know, 2000, having issues. That yeah. 2011, 2014. Yeah. So for, for people that are not from Louisiana or from people, if, if you're going to think 2000, 
eight was not a bad time where I lived. Mm -hmm. We actually crushed it because the oil field was booming. Katrina as well, though. Yeah. So Katrina hit, and a lot of people flooded yes. different markets with insurance money. You yeah. know all that. So we had a bit of an insulation down here. Yeah. Two two thousand eight for us was good. Two thousand fourteen for this area, Lafayette in, in Texas, we got crushed. Yeah. So that was about two thousand eight. That was when we things started going bad. That's when I got into wholesaling. It it forced me to pivot because I had all these shops. I had bought some rental properties, slow yeah. money real estate rental properties. Thought I bought a bunch of rental properties is going to solve all my problems. Yeah. You know, it's fine when they're all rented until they you know one moves out and you you, you get back to it. and It's got five thousand dollars worth of damage and right. and and then on top of that, the all field crashes and half of them go empty. I had to make a move because I was lit. I had, I had no. I was running out of money, so I, I pivoted to wholesaling. Yeah. 2014, I slayed it because the market was so inducive for motivated sellers because people right. were losing their houses. So the park. market changed. The market changed. Yeah. But interest rates were still low back then. Yeah. 2014. So yep. the market pulled back. There was not as many jobs, but the interest rates still low, so you still could get a job. So it wasn't that bad. And I started making. I remember I made $47,000 after I'd hired my second mentor, just putting out bandit signs back in 2014. And I, I told myself, I felt like I was doing something illegal. Yeah. Because like, you know how many brake jobs, tune-ups, oil changes, and windshields I got to change? Exactly. To make $47,000. And I, I knew I was in the wrong business. That next day when I got that check, I went and had a meeting with all my shop managers. I said, hey, listen, I'm not working over here no more. I'm going because I did that part time. I was still running my shop, putting out a bandit sign, making calls, changing oil, right. break jobs. And and I told them, I'm not coming back here unless That's somebody, y'all yeah. got to figure it out. Don't call me unless somebody dies. So yeah. I, went, I went full time. And wholesaling kept me from going bankrupt in 2014. I shouldn't have been bankrupt in 2014. Yeah. But that fast money yeah. um, was able. And look, and part of that was trying to piece that timing so you lost that 50 grand from that one coach yep. right around that time when you were close to the age and so um but you stayed with it right yep. and so okay so you you get that you see hey this fast money is really is yep. really working for you let's kind of fast forward to from then um more into your journey about where you are today yep. what does that look like so you started wholesaling full, went full time went full time i started making you know 50 60 80 100 six figures months and i, I was able to paper over my losses for my shops and that saved me from going bankrupt right i was making a lot of money but i wasn't because i was still rolling over 20 40 grand just to support my shops and my notes because i owned all these properties i had notes and then, and then finally i put them all for sale i ended up selling most of them i still have one today and made a big rip, a big national all chain bought me out. I made a, I made a lot of money on one deal. Matter of fact, I used that money to buy my beach house in Destin, Florida. Yeah. Got rid of all those, those, uh, those shops, and then went full time, uh, highly focused on real estate because I knew I wasn't going back to the sh shops no matter what. And I just, man, I started flipping houses. Yeah. Then I started raising, learn how to raise private money. Then I started buying mobile home parks. Yeah. And then now I'm developing neighborhoods, and, yeah. and I'm, but I'm still doing all the other stuff. I'm still wholesaling, flipping. Yeah. I'm still raising private money. I'm still buying. I bought a mobile home park last last week, a 67 unit in Brookshaven, Mississippi. And now I'm developing neighborhoods. And Patty's getting a GC license, and we we work in that progression, like I that like I talk about. I, I created Let's this. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about the the fast, uh, yes. medium, and slow money because I think people's philosophies are huge. How you approach real estate because a lot of people they're just like, oh well, let me just go. I want to buy some real estate this year. I'm like, hey, that's yep. not, you got to get clear on your understanding how yep. you're approaching it. So, so what's this philosophy? Well, it, it's, it's logic. It's not even my philosophy. It's just, it's basic logic. And if you, th I like to think an old wise man was telling me, you know, think in gradient scales when you do something, you, you shouldn't go from, you know, not knowing anything about real estate to trying to buy a hundred unit apartment complex. Right. I, I don't believe, I like, a lot of people talk, I don't believe in that philosophy. Like, well, but, but the thing about it, if you go to the gym, haven't ever lifted. I, I used to power lift base across it. If you go in and you've never lifted before and you're like, Hey, this 500 pound squat, let me go do it. Yeah. You're going to die. You know, like you're going right. to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. And that is where I came up with this philosophy. And I had to organize this data to make it make sense for me and to make it more understandable for my students yeah. so, so that they could go up the ladder of ascending you know, from starting from where they are to where they should be. And I, I had to break it down into smaller bit pieces. So I, I, I start off with, well, what is the velocity, the, the velocity, velocity of this money that I'm getting paid and, and, and why am I not making money when I buy a bunch of rental properties? 
yeah. thinking that I could just sell off. Cause I, I thought you just buy a bunch of rental properties and you just retire. Exactly. It, Come on, you can be a, you know, passive income, right? Passive income. And I was like, either they full of shit, I ain't doing something right or something's off. Right. So I just started doing research and, and like, and I stopped listening to everybody. That's one thing I stopped. I stopped research because everybody has to do this, do this, do this. I'm like, yeah. something ain't right. So I stopped listening to them. I'm like, okay, buying rental property to start off with is not the best advice unless you have a ton of cash and you need to park your cash. So I'm like, okay, what's the velocity of money? You got fast money, which is what? Stuff that transact on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. Sure. That's going to be a W-2. That's going to be a job. That's going to be a small business. That's going to be wholesaling. Yeah. That transacts on a typically a two to four week period wholesaling. Then you got medium velocity of money. That usually transacts on a three to six month basis. That's what? Flipping, yeah, small land deals. Um, that's a business that maybe you know that transacts every three months. You get paid every three months on a job. And then I'm like, okay, what's slow money? Slow money is what? Rental property, buying whole rental property, land development. People, you you might not get paid for a year to two years on a land development job. Yeah. The problem is a lot of people start off with slow money, thinking that's going to solve all their problems, and it doesn't until they got their fast money going. And then I had to break it down again. So you got fast, medium, and slow money. Now, what order of importance should you do this to where it builds on itself? Just like when you go to school and you learn the ABCs and the one, two, threes, that's the fundamental foundation to learning what? Words, syllables, sure. uh, multiplication, division, but you have to learn the basics. So what's the basics in real estate? How to find a deal. Yeah. That is the fundamental piece of real estate. If you don't know how to buy a deal, if you go try to buy a buy and hold property because you said you told you to buy assets, but you don't buy super discounted with a lot of equity because when cash flow doesn't work, what saves you? Equity. Equity. Like with your with your B class rentals or whatever yeah. you had, right? Um, you were buying it, you know, at eighty percent, but in a market that got really hit. Right, but you were buying it with that. Um, you were buying them at almost at one hundred percent when the market pulled back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, were you leveraged? Yeah, I put, I, but I had put twenty percent down. Yeah, so you were buying okay, and and so it put a huge part of that in that 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 leverage that's impacted, right? So yep. when you're especially when you're buying overpaying. Yeah, yeah, and that's so I, I had to think. I was like, well, well, shit. You know, if I'm buying rental properties and and I'm not buying them cheap enough because I didn't learn elementary school the fundamentals right. how to find a deal how do you find a deal right you do direct to seller marketing yeah. elementary school in real estate is direct to seller marketing how to find deals off market direct to seller from a motivated seller direct mail cold calling pbc seo facebook ads bandit signs driving for dollars all the things that we teach in wholesaling mm -hmm. you if you want to be a badass investor if you master how to find deals and you can steal deals legally, morally, and ethically. And I steal deals legally, morally, and ethically every damn near every other day through direct to seller marketing, everything else, buy and hold, flipping, land development works itself out because if I, if I mess up, I have a bunch of equity. Right. You see that? That is the fundamental well, piece. And, that, and that's huge. So, and that's right now in this market, we're seeing so many people who didn't buy a good deal, right? Yep. And, you know, because again, the market's changing now here in 2024, but, and one of the things we're talking about is you've got to be very, very careful because if you buy a great deal and for something like right now, the insurance crisis in Louisiana, that is, that's taking great deals and bumping it down to a good deal. Yep. But then what's happened to all the people who just only bought a good deal? It's now getting bumped down to a bad deal. Yep. Right. And so we're seeing so many people whose bad deals are getting fleshed out. And, and the good market saved them before, yeah. but now it's not saving them. You got to become a unicorn chaser. Mm -hmm. Only buy unicorns. Yeah. That's my philosophy. That's why I, people, I say, if you can't steal it legally, morally, and ethically, I don't buy it. Yeah. It's not being harsh or taking advantage of people. No, it's called good business practices. Well, it's I'm, knowing how to stay in the game. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I'm still here, to yeah. be honest with you. Yes. So elementary school is wholesaling, which is fast money. Yeah. You know, so you got fast, medium, and slow money. The next evolution, when you once you learn how to wholesale, you need to naturally. But everybody thinks it's flipping. It's not flipping. It's raising private money. Mm -hmm. That's junior high, mm -hmm. because 
another big mistake I made, and this is all from mistakes, by the way, how sure. I built this. I used all my own money to start flipping. I didn't raise money because I was too egotistical and arrogant to ask. It's not going to owe anyone anything. I'm not going to owe it. And what it, it was, it was, it was ego, to, ego, ego, and a lack of just like who's going to give me money and and self esteem. Like who's going to give me money? It was both. It was back and forth. So I was like, I used all my money to flip properties, and I was like, man, I'm freaking. I got all this money out. I'm broke again. Back yeah. to the drawing table. What did I mess up on? I'm using my own money, yeah. OPM. Yeah. That's your next evolution to junior high, learn how to raise private money. And guess what? When you know how to find good deals from elementary school, it's not hard exactly. to raise private money. Well, and I think that's critical because one of my biggest regrets is that I wholesaled away from my family, my estate, the best deals when I didn't have the ability, the skill to raise private money. I have one deal that like, if I ever want to motivate myself, I'll go look and see what it's worth. I should have one thousand percent contracted that deal. It's worth probably two eighty today. I had it on the contract at ninety three thousand. It needed fifteen in work. I should have taken that, but yep. because I didn't know how to raise, and especially longer term private money, yep, and it was huge. And that's the deal that like pissed me off enough that it, I started to learn how to do creative financing and private money. It messes you up if you don't learn that skill. Yep. It is the natural progression. Yep. Wholesaling, which is direct to seller marketing, raise private money. Because then you can start cherry picking from your wholesaling business and start flipping the best deals. How many deals have you ever wholesaled to somebody? That, uh, six months later, they give you a high five. Say, hey, thank you, Courtney. Right. You told you wholesaled me that deal. I made a hundred grand on it. Yeah. That was exactly. Or the ones that they wholesale it, and you're like, didn't do anything to it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, like, made sixty. Me. Yeah. yeah. That happened. I'm like, uh, um, that ain't gonna happen no more. So that forced me to to stop using my own money, and then one going almost going, you know, having having cash flow problems because I had all my cash out flipping and then two realizing that I could do way more flips if I'm not using my own money and I sleep better at night exactly and there's something about when you're using someone else's money that there's a level of accountability yes for most people we'll put a little asterisk there for most people because I had when I got started I was using a line a HELOC a home record line of credit and that thing, I just, I didn't have anyone. No one was vetting the deal. It was just me using it like cash, right? But then when I started using private money, my deals got so much better because I had so much, again, that it could vary by person. But like, I was like, look, I'm not going to use someone's money unless I know that this is a great deal. Yep. And, 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 and then when the private money lenders, they saw it, they're like, oh yeah, I'll definitely lend on that. Yeah. Yep. So wholesaling, raising private money, flipping which is flipping is high school. A lot of people start off with flipping yeah. and then they buy from wholesalers and then they find out the wholesalers are making more money than they are in flips. Yeah. You see how all this is stacked? I'm, I'm being long-winded because I want you to see the gradient scale of how this stacks fundamentally and it makes sense logically. Now, once you're, you're flipping and you're raising private money, there's even a, a, another tertiary level to the, to the raising private money. Once you get really comfortable raising private money and you, you've been doing it for a year or two and you've been paid back all your investors, you get really comfortable with the investors and they just like giving you money. And that's when you can really get slick like I've done and I put all of my interest on the back end. I don't even service the debt until it, it sells. Cause that was another thing I leveraged out. I, I had like 25 flips going and I was, I was writing checks on interest. I had to hire an extra girl in the office just to keep up with checks. So sometimes we'd have two or three people in a deal yep. for one deal times 25 deals. So I was writing a hundred checks a month, 75 checks a month. It was too much to keep up with. Mm -hmm. And I was, a lot of money was going out every month in interest. $25,000 a month was going out in interest. So then that made me do another thing where I started, Hey, Hey, Miss event lit. I mean, how you structure it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you've been giving me money for two years now. I pay you every time. You look at my deals. You can't lose on my deals because mm -hmm. I know how to do direct to sell and marketing. Exactly. It behooves you. Let's put it on the back end. So I, because you asked me if I need more money, I'm actually scared to borrow more money because I'm broke all the time because I'm writing checks for twenty-five dollars to $35,000 a month, just an in interest. And this deal is not going to close for the next four to six months. Let's put all that on the back end. No problem, right. Chris. I did that for you a long time and ago. When you, when you have the track record, but here's what's important though, too, is, is that at the end of the day, the deals you do are a direct re reflection of your skill set, right? Yeah. So the more that when you have that track record, right, with people, but my running joke with my lenders are like, I'm not going to keep you up at night 
worrying that I won't pay. I'm going to keep you up at night hoping I don't pay so you can get the deal. <laughs> like, you know, because you're like, hey, you're in such a good, safe That's position. exactly right. Because you bought it with That's a lot of equity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you probably you bought it at wholesale prices. Yep. Elementary school. So high school is medium money, which is the, you had the fast, medium, and slow money. Fast money is wholesale and medium money is flipping. Now you work in the progression, elementary school, junior high, high school. Now you're stacking a lot of cash because you're making big rips. Now you have a what problem? A tax problem. Tax problem, absolutely. Now it's time. That's the evolution. That's the entrepreneur, real estate guy telling me, hey, buddy, now you're ready for slow money buying whole real estate. Right. Because you got a serious tax problem. You can go give 100000 200000 whatever it may be, to Uncle Sam, or you can just take that hundred, two hundred thousand. let's go buy a piece of real estate, but we're going to buy it right because we're going to take it from one of the, the wholesaling pipeline that we have from direct to sell element, right. uh, element in school. And then if you don't really want to, you can raise money now and keep your own money and not even put your own money in there. Right. Really, that's a that's a slick way of doing it. If you, you keep all of your own cash and you raise money for, for slow money right. and you still don't pay taxes and you keep your cash. My cash is defense. Yeah. I've always treated my cash yeah. as defense. Other people's money is how I play off offense. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's a good, that's a really good strategy because I, I don't think it's smart just to deploy all of your personal cash all over the place because when the market pulls back like it's now, I know a lot of rich guys that had a lot of cash that are absolutely broke right now. Yeah. Their yeah. money's out in all kinds of deals that are not yeah. performing. Correct. And so your property rich cash pool. Yes. Yep. So it's better to use OPM on even when, on your buy and hold and just keep your cash. Yep. I think that's critical. Yep. So that's now buy and hold is slow money. Yep. So you've worked. You've been wholesaling, you've been flipping, you've been raising money for probably going on, say, three to four years. And there's a, t there's a life cycle, there's a time cycle in this too, by the way. Wholesaling is usually a one to two year life cycle to master, so you're really good. Flipping is about another two years. You're about four years in. And in fi year five, that's when you should start getting into slow money and start buying rental properties. Yeah. Now, say you're, you're, you're five, six years deep and you've bought you know, hundreds of doors now. What's the next evolution after that? After high school, college, land development. That that's where all the big boys play. That's um, that's why you see me. I'm building neighborhoods all over the. You know, remember I got three neighborhoods going in, in Louisiana. I got one in Alabama going. I'm buying raw land and I'm developing neighborhoods because I I know how to buy land at wholesale prices. I know how to raise private money. I know the construction process, right. and I've done buy and hold. And now I'm going for bigger flips and I have a lot more confidence because I went through this whole cycle yeah. but I've been doing this for 10 years mm -hmm. I started in 2014 see and that's slow money and I tell people like you you don't want to start with land development but you're not going to get super rich right. wholesale and flipping properties you're going to have a badass income and make a lot of money but if you want to make millions of dollars mm -hmm. you eventually got to get into land development well and I think it's important for people so some so I have some clarifying questions for you on these so I think it's important for people to understand because you get so many people, again, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. I saw someone on YouTube or TikTok. Now I want to invest in real estate. When yep. we ask them what they want to do, oh, I want to get into development. I want to build apartments from the ground up. And I'm like, do you own the house you live in? You know, do you, you know what I mean? Like, like, like have you bought a house before? You know, that yeah. type of thing. So it is critical because, yes, you can make money in real estate. You can make a, a little bit. You can make a lot. But you can also lose a little bit. You can lose a lot. Yep. And so that's where it's one of those things where people, they want to jump the gun. Um, but one question, you talk about how it's like, hey, you know, rentals are slow money. Yep. Although you're getting money on a monthly basis, it's transacting monthly. Why would you classify that as slow, even though the money's coming in monthly? Because a few rental properties are not going to change your life, for one. And, you know, a couple hundred bucks on a rental property is not going to change your life, first of all. And secondly... Dude, you're just one, you're 30 days out from having a $10,000 bill from a tenant destroying your, your house. Yeah. And you made $6,000 in positive cash flow right. that whole year. Now you're, you're back, you're, you're, you're back, they pushed you back a year and a half. Exactly. So if, and I tell a lot of people this, I don't look at real estate for cash flow. If I want to make cash flow, I'll buy my business. My wholesaling flipping business is my cash cow, yeah. not my rental properties. I buy rental properties for first and foremost depreciation so I don't have to pay taxes yeah. that's the most important thing why I think rich people just go dump pe money and, and some, they buy stuff that don't even make sense just so right. they don't have to give it to Uncle Sam right first and foremost depreciation second is the best store value mm -hmm. 
It's inflation hedge. It's an inflation hedge. Three, it, inflation hedge. Four, principal pay down. Yeah. Five, then cash flow. Yeah. So you understand that's the order of importance. Right. Logically, depreciation, best store of value, hedge against inflation, uh, depre de um, principal pay down. I forgot to say that principal pay down, mm -hmm. and hopefully we get some inflation. And then last but not least, hopefully it cash flows. Yeah. And in some years it does cash flow, but then you know you have a metal roof. You got to change out on a, on a, a trailer that cost me. I had a metal roof on a double wide. I have on a on a waterfront property in Falls River, Louisiana. That cost me six thousand yeah. dollars. That's probably what I make on that thing the whole year. Well, and that's important. So a lot of people again, yeah, they're thinking passive income. This is you know financial freedom. All these things. There's there's variations. They don't realize that real estate, especially in the single family space, but even in others, is a game of inches where it's, you know, basically it's a slow roll until suddenly yeah. those are things like when you've got that, all those things start compounding. You've got the, you know, the amortization is a huge part. When that starts compounding with appreciation, yeah. you're like, all right, then I got a little bit more wiggle room, right? Right. Rents go up. Rents go up, all those things. And yep. so my gray hair guys, they're really big on the inflation, inflation hedge part. They're, yep. they're, you know, um, they're the ones who are like, when they're watching what the government's doing right now, they're like, I, all I want is to buy more properties because all yep. I know what's going to happen is just inflation, inflation, right. inflation. And so, which is huge. Yeah. Um, and, and because businesses aren't in inflation hedge. No. And so that's an important thing. Businesses aren't the bit, you know, end all be all. They each serve different purposes. Yeah, for sure. And you got to play five year game when you're buying a piece of real estate. Like mm -hmm. that, I just bought a 67 unit uh, mobile home park in Brookshaven. I, I'm not even, I'm not trying to worry about if I get distribution. So that, that, that's a five year play. I knew the rents, an old man had it for 22 years. Right. When we bought it, his rents are at 650 bucks. Market rent is 850 in that area. Yeah. I know that we can slowly go up to, and, and damn near take the rents from 32,000 to almost 50,000. Right. Because we can, we can go from 650 to 850 and we can add 12 more units in there. That's going to take a long time. Yeah, it's going to take. Overnight. Yeah, and then and then it's, there's someone there that need to that need to be renovated, and then you have people that destroy some of the units. Yeah, I had people a, move out. They move out. I had a fire. Yes, uh, two days ago I had a fire. I don't know if you saw my social media. Yeah. I posted a, a park owned in Indiana. Two parks owned in Indiana. One of them, kids were. I just finished renovating. Kids were shooting bottle rockets uh, into the into the unit. It caught on fire and, and burned to the ground. Of course they did. But well, in those things, and, and so a lot of times with rentals, I'm like, look, if you're depending on them too soon, you know, making it a, a quick cash play for the cash flow versus that longer term thing, when you depend on it too soon, that's when you put yes. it at risk, right? You're going to yep. be property rich, cash poor, or for example, they get in there, rents are 650, they immediately tell everyone it's going to be 850, and then everyone moves out, yep. right? Because they're so cash flow hungry. Versus being willing to look at the big picture and saying, hey, this is going to be a bigger, you know, longer play. Yeah. I mean, they got to stop looking at it as a piggy bank and look at it as like putting money in the stock market and it's retirement. Like you really ain't going to make no money on those properties until they paid off. Yeah. You making money off those properties by not paying taxes in the beginning. In the beginning, you're using depreciation to not pay taxes to offset your fast money. You're using your slow money to offset your fast and medium money. Yeah. And then you're hoping in 10, 15 years, you maybe have it paid down or paid off. That's when you really start making money and you get the, the really net effect of, of buying real estate where if you got it paid off and then you do a cash out refi and you refinance the whole thing and you maybe paid a million for it. Now it's worth, you know, 10 years later, it's worth a million and a half or, or let's say $2 million. Yeah. And then you refi and you pull out $1.6 million tax free yep. and you start all over again. Hey guys, Courtney Fricky here. We've got Aussie Steve. And look, if you have a deal that needs to get moved, Southeast Louisiana, even in South Mississippi, we're your folks. We are the largest dispo company, really in the greater New Orleans area, even Southeast Louisiana. We have great contacts in South Mississippi as well. Steve, why do we move more deals than others? Just we're very deep in this market. So, so uh, Greater New Orleans can be really confusing for national wholesalers. The comps are hard. We change block for block. We've got flood zones. You know, we get a lot of hurricanes and the likes. Uh, and just a lot of the national platforms don't have the buyers on their yeah. list. So uh, we, we are deep with buyers, but we're deep with relationships, which is really important in this market. So we love JV with out-of-state investors. Like I said, we do a ton of business with other investors. So go to homebuyerlouisiana.com slash Courtney Fill out the information, we'll get in touch with you and we'll move this deal along. Right, and those benefits, and, and so that's a huge part, but again, everyone is so like, hey, I wanna leave my job today. 
all, and, live, rentals. and live off my cash flow. Yeah, I've had rentals for, so I got started, I got in the industry in 2014. I've had rentals, I think I started getting into them around 2017, somewhere around that time. I've never taken a penny from them because they're yeah. still, you know, they're still growing up and, and I don't want to depend on them too soon. So I think that's great. Um, I think, you know, all of this is critical for people to understand whenever they're like, hey, I want to get into real estate. Hey, you need to understand, you know, I mean, I started flipping. And then I got into wholesaling yep. and then I got into rentals, right? But it's all of those things are important because a lot of people, you know, I had a guy just yes a few days ago was like, Hey, I'm looking to buy my first property. And he was wanting to buy a completely termite infested property. I'm like, hey, look, first of all, not for your first deal. And then like be careful, right? Again, you can get taken out. Another thing is during the cycles, those different things matter. There's a lot of flippers right now who are struggling. Yeah. Right? And, and so like different, different strategies have different, uh, strengths and different cycles. A lot of wholesalers are struggling too and got out of the business. Some of the biggest games in the business, biggest business in, in, in wholesaling all stopped because they, they did that magical word that everybody thinks is cool on Instagram, scale, yeah. scale, scale, scale. Yeah. I spoke at a, I spoke at a mastermind in New Orleans, um, a year ago, maybe then, and it was, it was, you would know. You would know the people in the room. Um, the number one conversation. So I got there. I spoke somewhere around lunch. I got there an hour early. Stayed a little bit afterwards. The number one conversation in the room was descaling. Yep. Because everyone was like, there's so much struggle with scaling, yep. and so scaling is a sexy word. Um, but but I want to take that to transition to my next one. Everyone's like scale, scale, scale. Staff overhead. All the people who are struggling right now. Look, in, during COVID, I had seven people on my team. I had a little uh, an office that we we were using. I scaled back. It's now it's just me and a handful of partners. Some deals it's deals by myself. Some deals it's deals with different partners. And so I've scaled with partners since 2020. Yep. Let's talk about your view on partnerships and things so, like that. So I love this beautiful question because I did the scaling thing. I was like, you guys are stupid. I, I, I did it. I did it back. I tried every model. Backyard. There's three ways to wholesale. Backyard. Backyard wholesaling nationwide. And then I created what I call a hybrid, which I'll get into here in a second once, once we uh, finish talking about scaling. You get into what's called the, the uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When you start scaling like that, especially in wholesaling, the, uh, well, I'm, I'm funneling my words here, but let me, let me back up. So when you, what is scaling? Scaling is when you can, drive top line revenue but keep your bottom line economies of scale yeah at the same right that's scaling that's like a true scale where you're profitable okay you stopped your, your bottom line overhead right here but your revenue keeps profit. going up but if yeah. but if you scale and you in your bottom line revenue just matches this that's not scaling look if, if, if you're 20 percent profit it'd be a whole lot less stress because you just yeah. paid 20 percent yeah. profit at a lower that's right yeah, and the word i was looking for i was telling you guys you get into the law of dimish, diminishing returns Right. So what happens is wholesaling has its, its like peak. I would say the best wholesaling and flipping business is probably do in between a million and two million bucks. Anything beyond that is just, is too cumbersome. Mm -hmm. And anything below that is, is, is um, you, you're leaving money on the table. So I've found a million to two million dollars in a wholesaling business. You're talking gross or net? Gross. Yeah. And gross revenue. Only. Yes. Yeah. And, and you should net, you should be at about a 50 to 60% net profit. Yeah. With with a smaller staff, that's where I find to be the best profit range, a gross revenue range, that where I'm still really profitable. I try to go beyond. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Now, back to what I was telling you about backyard wholesaling, nationwide, and what I've called hybrid. What I've done, because I've done the backyard, did well. I did the nationwide. I was like, this is this is not fun. It's too cumbersome because you're trying to close people on the phone, send people to take pictures, yada yada yada. So I was like, how can I? scale this without scaling it and make a lot of money and keep my overhead down. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, not having a boots in the ground makes it tough. Why don't I partner up with the best students that I have in my program in the markets I want to be in? I'll, I'll pay for the marketing or get in the beginning, I was paying for all the marketing. I take, I take the leads and I just send the best leads to them in their market. Then they go with, with no office, with no, you know, a transaction coordinator, disposition manager, right. all this stupid stuff that you hear. 
It's just them being salespeople. Yeah. It, yeah. And, and I, I said, they can just go lock them up. And why can't, why can't my acquisition guy do disposition? Right. I always I asked myself that for years. All these guys, that's the acquisition section. That's the disposition. I do both. Right. It's just a phone call. It's not that, it's not that complicated. So I, I would, I would send the best leads. I end up having about four partners about four years ago. We're doing good. We're doing about 2 million bucks a year in wholesale and flipping. I had no overhead. Zero. I had my girls in my office that, that, would, that were there for more or less for my slow money rental property. But the overhead was just my time answering the phone calls, my time raising the money for their flips, and just their time going yeah. to the appointment. It, that's it. Yeah. And what about all the marketing stuff for that? Yeah, I paid for the marketing, but I got paid back on the trans yeah. out of the deal. And it was a true fit. And I, I would do a 60 40 split. I would keep 60%. Mm -hmm. of the, you, were, you were funding the marketing. I was funding the marketing and they did all the work and I funded the, f the flips I would raise the private money yeah. I ended up flipping that because I had a couple of partners go south because they got they kind of got lack of days because they didn't have nothing to lose yeah. and and so I stopped paying for marketing I still do it with my partners that I still in business with today but all my new partnerships right now we're up to 10 partners all over the country they pay for the marketing because they got skin in the game. Yeah. I've, because, and then I feel that it yeah. gives, yeah, makes them accountable because this is their money on loan, not right. online, not mine. I take the calls. I raise the private money for them. We both sign the debt for the private money and I pay them back first before we do a 50 50 spot uh, profit. But I do, instead of doing 60 40, I'm giving them more equity. So we do 50 50. They pay for the marketing. I raise the money. We, we sign both in the debt if we're going to flip it. Yeah. And, and we don't, we don't flip big, big properties. It's like if it needs the 20 grand and 30 grand max, yes. we turn and burn, we wholesale. And that model is scalable, Courtney. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it right now. Well, because it's, it's scaling through partners yes. and shared responsibility. And no employees. Right. It's just, and it's hundred percent. Now there is going to get to the point where I can't take any more calls. Right. So that'll be the bottleneck will be yes. with the phone calls. And yes. I mean, the money. yeah. I mean, I've had, you know, four missed calls. That's, Part, well, most of them are partners or people probably call them from my direct mail letters. Yeah. But the only, I'm not, you don't hire people until you can't do it no more. I mean, I think that so many people, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I remember very, very vividly someone called me and they're like, hey, you know, this guy went to a conference or did a mentorship or something, comes out of it learning about wholesaling and immediately hires a staff. Team. And this, this girl was running his, running, running his office. And by month two, she came to me, she said, we haven't closed any deals and he hasn't paid me yet. Can I come work for you? I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm like, you know, Hey, I'm sorry, but no. And so there's a level there that I think way too many people look, all the people who are preaching scaling often have some affiliate link tied to that scaling you know, thing that's going on there. So there's, there's alternative motives and all Absolutely. that. And so, but scaling, not everyone needs to scale. And and look, I'll be very honest. I don't consider myself a business person. I may be entrepreneurial in some ways, yeah. but I consider myself more than anything a, a specialist in the investor world. I don't yeah. want to scale a business. I like that. It's a specialist in the investor world. Like, because I don't, I don't want to have staff. I don't want to scale it to start. I'm like, look, I want, there's a certain, it, but, but, but people are all like, oh, well, I, I have to, because that's what I was sold. I was sold. That's that what I you were, that's what you were told. That's, that's what I want you guys to understand. That's what you were told by the Instagrams. You, you don't, you're not supposed to work in your business. That's beneath you, Chris. Yeah. I, I've had so many gurus. None of these guys are in business anymore. I'm way beyond them now, but they would always, they would like, are you working in your business? Yeah. Cause I make a lot of money. Yeah. And it's also the blue collar roots, but it's like a level there that people are scared of work, right? Yeah. I'm too good to work, right? Exactly. But it's the, you know, and if I don't have an executive assistant or a team to Or C-suite. Yeah. And so there's a level there that, you know, I had to come to that realization that I don't want to have a business that I own, but you have to make that, that, yeah. that, that difference there. But when I started meeting in people who were full-time investors versus business owners, because I realized business owners chase profit. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I was ultimately chasing things like cash flow, amortization, appreciation, the things that are in my investments, yeah. right? They're very different. They're very, very different. Yeah. And so, um, so I love this idea of scaling partnerships. You know, I've been doing it since 2020, so for the last four years. And, you know, not all partnerships have gone sure, you know, to sure. plan. And so any suggestions on betting partnerships, any yeah. lessons you've Absolutely. learned? Absolutely. And, and I would say the, you know, the, 
the partnership thing turned into the allies brand, by the way. That's how I created allies, you know, no friends, only allies. You know, I, I don't I don't work with people because I think they're cool or they're funny or, right. or, you know, I just like them. I work with them because they have a unique skill set that I don't have mm -hmm. and they give value in a way that I can't, yeah. right? So to answer your question, you should not be partnering up with your best friend from high school because you think they're cool. Or your family member just because or you're your, with one on one. Yes, because you come from their body, right? Yeah. Or you come from theirs. You partner up with. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm an over the top kind of guy. It's not for everybody. But a lot of people probably don't like my personality. But that, I'm a driver. I'm a high D. Mm -hmm. It took me years to realize that because I, you know, fuck man, I don't really get along with a whole lot of people. Yeah. And it's because high D's are drivers that yeah. you know take the disc personalities yeah. they're really good at, at just like pushing a needle yeah. and getting yeah moving it along right and i realized if i tried to partner up with another high d person even though i liked them a lot it never worked no so the best partnerships for me are people that are exact opposite usually introverts dude i work so good with introverts right. I love they don't them. want to be the face they want you to be the face yeah yes they want me to be the out there promote promote sales i what, what i'm good at courtney i drive revenue yeah. That's all I do all day. I can draw. I can look and see where are the gaps are, where we can make money. I can see the strategic advantage and hit the gaps where, but I'm not thinking about all the things behind me that have to be put in place right. to make that happen. And that's where an analytical style personality comes in. Who's a spreadsheet guy. Yeah. Like my best partner, Kyle, he's been with me for seven years out of Panama city. He just, matter of fact, he just won, um, ally, most honorable ally at my, at my event. Right. I gave him a big plaque and a, a big buoy knife and, and love the guy. And he's not somebody that I would even ever hang out with. Yeah. But I love the guy because we made a bunch of money together because our personalities are like love when it yeah. comes to business and relationships. Exactly. Well, and I think and I think that's critical. That was a mistake I made was I partnered with someone you who, who were too similar, right? Yeah. But then I've learned to partner with people. It's like the idea of I never want to go to the office. Very similar. I'm going to be driving revenue. I'm going to be building relationships. I'm going to be doing that. And then I have, I have a partner who doesn't want to leave the office. And I'm like, excellent. They, they want to be back pushing processes yeah. and, and getting those repeatable processes down. And I'm like, excellent, you can do that, right? And and I've also partnered, one of my best partnerships was I partnered with a business owner. I'm not someone who wants to own a business and be thinking about staff, scale, all that. Yep. And I'm like, I'm happy to, to partner with that, right? Yep. But that's not what I want to build. Yep. Um, so so let me let me ask, because I want to be caught cognizant of the time. Yeah, no, we're good, we're good. Um, is, Look, anytime when it comes, so so with these partnerships, you're in different parts of the, the country, mm -hmm. right? Um, any markets that you're enjoying right now? That I'm what? Enjoying. Man, I just partnered up in uh, Kokomo, Indiana. I probably shouldn't be saying that. But but you're in, in and so you're in Indiana. Yeah, right? we are crushing it over there. Okay. Um, I know you're in the Florida market. I'm in the Florida market. I do a ton in Baton Rouge. I do I do a good amount, a ton in Lafayette. Um, Dallas, Texas. I mean, over there. Yeah. Uh, where else am I at? So you're doing these different markets. Maybe you understand what I'm talking about. But every time I go get in a room where it's national people, mm -hmm. I struggle to justify Louisiana. Okay. Let, I'm glad you brought that up. So you see what I'm saying? Yes. So <laughs> if you can, if you can be a successful real estate investor in Louisiana, you are a bad mofo. You are a bad mofo. Meaning, dude, this is a hard market. We are the second to poorest nation in the whole union behind mississippi we have the worst demographics we have the worst migration patterns we have right. 4.7 million people that live in louisiana we lose 50,000 people a year yeah. to to job transfer people trying to go chase better opportunities this ain't the best state to be in and i just had my mastermind in, in nashville tennessee and i've been telling him asking my wife why are we in louisiana yeah why i um so i, I frequently go down to my mentor down in tampa i was just there um I go there from 2014 to 2019. If a house is worth 100, it doubled. Yep. From 2019 to 2023, it doubled again. So it went from 200 to 400. And I'm sitting here. I, look, I did this podcast at one of my mentors, one of my top five mentors' house in Sarasota. This guy is 77. Um, I go to his house that he bought in Sarasota in 1985 for 185,000, which back in 1980s, 185,000 was a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. It's worth near 10 million today. And I'm like, I want to just throw this. You know, like I'm yeah. just, part of that though is he bought a great house in a great location. Yeah. You know, the land is what's going up. 
Yep. The land's not going up, and I guess we can make a joke about it. it's going down. Yep. Technically, it's you know sinking, but you know we have the hurricanes, and I really you know it is hard to justify staying in Louisiana yep. some days. Yep, we're on the bottom of a lot of lists. We you know we can't catch a break with you know hurricanes, tornadoes, all yep. that insurance crisis. So, tell me. You know, with your partnerships, was there anything that was driving that behind the whole Louisiana? Yeah. I can't just stay here. Talk yeah. to me about that. So I, I did all that for one to to scale a wholesale and flipping business. I knew I could make a lot of money, but I wanted to be in the in the areas that I knew that I could make money. But also had to make sure I had really good operators. So I just didn't partner with anybody. It was people that were studs yeah. that were in my program or I met at masterminds. What was the question? I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so, but was there a driving factor with scaling with these partnerships because of what Louisiana yes. is? Yes. Yes. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not going to be here much longer. I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably be here maybe another five years max. And I'm slowly doing it part time. I mean, I have a house in Destin, Florida on the beach and Gulf Shores. We go to Gulf Shores all we'll the time. We travel a lot. We travel a lot. I'm, I'm out of, we, we're out of here once a month, sometimes twice a month. I'm not, I'm yeah. going. But I want to create enough strategic partnerships all over the country. I have enough money coming in that makes There's sense. Streams of income. Yes. Right? There's streams of income. Yes. And so and it's important to understand, you know, streams of income isn't, you know, e-commerce, you know, um, real estate, you know, this business, that business, this bit. No, it's it's a lot of streams of income from similar, you know, fields. Right. But the idea there, though, I mean, there's a level there that I was talking with, a, I was speaking the other day at something with, um, and one of the local representatives, state representatives was there. And the conversation I had with them was Texas, all the Gulf states, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, they're all killing it economically right now. Even in the difficult time, they've yep. just been thriving. Yep. And the only one not thriving is Louisiana. Louisiana. Yep. And so a lot of people are asking that question right now. Do I yep. keep my investments here? I, you know, the stuff that you own here in Louisiana. Let's talk about that because I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm slowly selling off everything I got in Louisiana. I'm moving to Tennessee in the next. We're, I just had. It looked like y'all were, were shopping. shopping out there. I was shopping real estate. Yeah. I have three partners. I got one in Nashville. I got one in Dixon. And I got one in Chattanooga. Yeah. And I'm set. That's why I got three just in that state because I'm setting up shop. I'm going to Tennessee. Yeah. Well, and Tennessee is no income tax, right? Yep. So, so there is a level that I'm also shopping in Florida. Um, my trip just there in Tampa. And yeah, so that's a great market. There's a level there. Um, I, I've been going to that market for years. I have so, I have a deep, deep um, level of uh, support out there and partners, whatever. Um, I, I could raise money in a heartbeat. You're well connected. I literally went out there and one of them were like, hey, I'll sell you one of my properties with favorable financing. And I'm like, what can you ask for? You know, what, yeah. what can you ask for? But there's something to be said, and, and my biggest thought is, you know, I'm not necessarily giving up my stuff in Louisiana quite yet. I am going to work both markets, yep. but there is a level. My biggest question is return on my skill set. Mm, that's so good. Because literally when I was out there in April, I, I was supposed to fly to go speak. Before there was a conference, I was speaking the day before. And so it was like a Thursday event. I was flying out on Wednesday, and the weather was getting bad. And I was like, there's no way my bird's going in the air. You know, I'm like, so I just, at the last minute, started driving. That was the day we had that tornado down right outside of New Orleans. And back in April, and so on the drive there, I thought I was going to listen to a podcast, catch up on some book. You know, no, I had phone calls all day long with all my five different property managers checking in all my properties because I'm like, you know, the freaking tornado hit my yep. hometown. And, um, and I'm sitting here, I'm like, we can't catch a break, right? On top of that, we've got population decline, insurance crisis, my, you know, all these things. And then to go there and hear about, you know, the guy who bought a house for 185. And so I, I literally asked him, um, one of my gray haired mentors, I said, do you believe location matters for someone's portfolio? Like, I know that it's a, sounds like a stupid question. And he goes, well, every time I go to speak in Los Angeles, one guy says, you have to, you know, I have to introduce him. And so he goes, you know, this is Pete. You know, he made me a multimillionaire because in the 80s, I had 15 properties in Hollywood and he told me not to sell. And now they're worth, you know, all this. And he made me a multimillionaire. And um, Pete smirked back and he goes, well, no one in Ohio has ever told me that. So I think it's important because, yes, it's a part of don't sell. Like that was an equation, but it was also location. Because, again, the people who bought in Cleveland in 1985, you know, and still have today, 
you know, they may not be multimillionaires, right? Just because of the level of appreciation or whatever. It just depends, right? And so there's a level there that I don't know fully what it'll look like for me, but I am. I started buying in South Mississippi, and I'll still own some there, but I'm, I'm considering. Now, it's not going to be easy because those are, again, each new markets have, have, have tried to beat my butt before. So it's yeah. like, it's... That's where it's important to have the right allies and partners. And so that's yeah. one of the ways I'm looking into that. So Yeah, that's a good move. And I, and I think it's just smart. I mean, if you're not paying attention to what your state's doing, Louisiana is not looking good at all. I mean. Yeah. And it's driving a lot of people and a lot of money out. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, and so now at the same time, it can create some opportunity. Sure. But I'm being very selective to, yes. to get the prime yes. location. Prim- that's right. And so, um, all right. So. To start to, to land the plane here, it's a change in market. We're in a, and, and here in Louisiana, it's a tough state, uh, but you know, different markets and different places are having different impacts. Are you pivoted in any way other than considering other states right now? In what way, like financially? Whether it be strategies that you're doing, okay. you know, like I know a lot of flippers who are sitting on the sideline. I know people who, you know, you know, you know, there's a lot of different things, people, but is there anything that you've been doing that you've pulled back on or that you've started doing more of? I, I stopped buying so many buy and hold rental properties. I mean, f- from 2017 to 2023, I bought 19 mobile home parks. It's a lot of slow money. Yeah. Biggest mistake I made when the market pulled back in 2023, I, I want to end, I want to tell this and end with this because it's so important. It's the biggest mistake I made in real estate. I was making so much money, Courtney. I was making two or 300000 a month. From my wholesaling, my flipping, my consulting, my coaching, my coaching, my masterminds, my wife being a realtor. When I would buy a mobile home park, I wouldn't raise any money for the capex because I had so much cash that I would just I would I would rehab all the trailers with all my money because I needed a place to park it. I did that for for four years, and then when the market pulled back. And I wouldn't make a couple hundred grand a month anymore from wholesale. All your money stuck in properties. All that money stuck in properties. I was thinking in my mind, I'm just going to refinance when everything stabilizes and raise the rent. Well, yeah. you know, but two thirds through rehabbing everything. Twenty. Thank God I was almost done with everything. I still got about I got about 24 trailers left to rehab out all my portfolio, and I'm done. Like everything is completely done. Yeah. Probably well less than that. Probably about 18. Add one more for the fire. Well, that yeah. might be a new unit coming. Yeah, in. that's right. Um, so we're gonna. So I, I put all that money in there and the market pulled back and I still had trailers to rehab, but I didn't stop rehabbing the trailers. So I burned through a lot of my personal savings cash because I wanted to get it done. And I was a, that was a lesson, like always use OPM. Yeah. Don't, don't freaking so use your money. Back to what you just said about, hey, you look at, you look at your cash as, as, a, as defense. Yeah. I, I didn't, I look at it now as defense. I wish you'd have told me that five, six years ago. Well, and it was learned from hard lessons, yeah. right? Because well, you can be property rich, cash poor. Yep. But, but, but how much of that is your own money that's stuck in those? And um, I, I went and, and for my YouTube channel, I, um, I picked an a, opinion. I wanted to film like a little five minute segment. I'll probably grab this from you afterwards. But what are your views on, you know, debt or free and clear on rentals? So I'll grab your thoughts yep. on that. But I got a whole bunch when I was at a conference with some of these old school, right? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years in the game. And I filmed them five minutes or less. What are your thoughts? It's very interesting. But one of the biggest things they said is when money is close to home and working at home, you really only make like a 5% return. Meaning when it's a free and clear asset, your return on money is like 5%, but it's really safe because, well, we mean it's you, the operator, right? Yeah. But when you can make a higher return when you send it out, but it's more risky, right? Yeah. It, will that operator perform? You have right. this control, all that. And um, so it's interesting, right? But at the end of the day, it's a lesson how to learn the hard way, yep. right? And so, um, all right, interesting. So I, I told you this question ahead of time. If there's one lesson that if you learn sooner, what is that lesson that would catapult your career if you would have learned it sooner? I wouldn't, you know, I, I would have I would have joined more masterminds because I had to figure a lot of stuff out on my own. I think hiring a coach is uh, is good, but you got to be careful right now because there's so many scam artists. But a true mastermind that costs a lot of money to get into. What does that mean for you? Like, is that you know, um, how how would you define a mastermind? Like, well, what are some key elements that you would look the, for? 
the first mastermind, the true first mastermind I went to was in 2017. I went to Grant Cardone's first 10X conference, his first one. There was only 15, 1,500 people there. I paid 10000 per ticket to be at the very front. I sat next to Michael Jordan's mentor for two straight days, Tim Grover, and we talked two straight days. I think I met you in 2019 or 2018 at a 10X. Mm -hmm. It was the only one I ever went to, but yep. y'all had sp it was I sponsored it. Sponsored. Yep. Yeah, so maybe it was 2019 or something yep. like that. Yeah. Because I, I, yeah. Oh, something like that. So that that was that was expensive, right? But man, I got around super high performance people that were no bullshitters. They were they're trying to help, and and that was more of a now Grant stuff is huge. It's a conference now, but it was a conference back then. But fifteen hundred people was still small for what he does now. I would get into I wouldn't get into rooms like that. I would get into rooms that are fifty or less that are expensive to get into. Because if you guys are going to sit there and pay college, you know, send your kids to college or, or, or pay to go to college and spend seventy, eighty, hundred thousand dollars to get a college degree, and you ain't willing to spend five grand to go sit in a in a room for two straight days with people that are multi, multi millionaires. Well, and the critical part is that you're in rooms with people who are actually doing things. who've done it. So, so I used to spend thirty grand a year to be in in masterminds. We'd meet four times a year, stuff like that. And I would be around other people who were doing it and we would improve each other. We'd collaborate, but we would improve each other because yeah. we were all learning because we were in the yeah. streets together and, and we yeah. could, you know, but I think what's important is, you know, I'll go to six to 10 conferences a year, yeah. but like how many of those conferences are there? You know, you want to be careful not being in a room where you're the, you know, smartest one in the room. Yep. Yeah. That's right? right. Or the, the, the richest, yeah. you know, For you sure. want to be in rooms where you're with people who are moving and shaking because that that's where you go learn is from the people yep. who are in the trenches, um, yep. not the has-beens or the right. dreamers. Yeah, and I would finish it with, if I wish I'd have known my, my fast, medium, and slow money and my progression. If somebody would have told me this when I was 22 years old, or even when I first started buying real estate at 26, I bought my first commercial, but let's just back up to 30. When I was 31, I started buying single family homes. If I'd have known about fast, medium, and slow money, depreciation, all the five things we talked about, what yeah. the most important thing is about slow money, and then work that progression, just that progression chart of what I just told you, of elementary school, junior high, high school, so on and so forth, that saved you, all, that saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars in mistakes, yeah. probably millions, right? Um, that's the formula. Yeah. And I, I think it's important because I, uh, I love hearing, I love asking that question because it's like, hey, what was the thing that cost you a lot to learn? Yeah. Right. It's usually when I ask that question, what's that one lesson that if you were going to sooner you would catapult it? It's the thing that, man, I'm 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 flying now once I once I get it right, that clarity. Yeah. Um, look, I've enjoyed the conversation. Um, likewise. Before we go and, and you share where people can, you know, connect with you online and learn more, any other final thoughts you kinda wanna lead with, uh, leave people with here? I would say always keep scaling up. Like I always say, I mean, it's true. I don't just say it because I think it's cool. Like it's a philosophy I live by. I, yeah. I, and I think that's probably one of the biggest ones that you and I share together. Yeah. It's that idea that the skills are so critical. And skills are everything. Skill you know, tonight I'm sharing at your, your event here at your yeah. house. And literally I said in a down in down markets, hobbyists fail, true skills will prevail. Ooh, so good. And like, that's that. literally my first, the first point that I'm, that I'm, I'm living and breathing off of. Yeah. And, and I would, I would say keep scaling up, but you, to really, understand and, and be competent and skilled you understand that you've got to master the basics first and foremost and you got to put in thousands of reps not hundreds thousands yeah. bruce lee once said i don't fear the man that knows ten thousand moves i fear the man that's done one move ten thousand times right. i've done one move ten thousand times courtney yeah. and that's why i've prevailed and that's why i've gotten as far as i've gotten and i just didn't quit yeah i don't quit i'm hard-headed yeah so yeah. i love that man well from one louisiana folk to another it's always good chatting and hanging out What's the best way that folks can get in touch with you? Where do you want them to yeah, go? Yeah, you can go to Instagram at Real Estate Root and follow me there. Um, Chris Root on Facebook, YouTube, Chris Root Entrepreneur. I put out content, you know, just mindset, real estate, entrepreneur skills, everything. If I come out to one of my masterminds, the Allies Mastermind. I do every quarter or this local meetup called The Alliance, which you're speaking at tonight. I do those every other month at my house just to be around people like you and create some value and try to see where we can make some money together.